guys ready to re-sing that song we learned last week? About Jesus our King. I hope you remember it. So you can sing it with me this morning. Y'all do that. You gave your life for mine. Nailed to the cross. You crucified all my sin and shame. It was washed in your mercy. And you are the treasure I If you're comfortable, just lift your hands a little bit as we sing this up this morning.
stay here in this moment with you. Take away all distractions, God, so we can just linger.
hands down. And all of our guards down, Lord, that you can, you're the only one that can come into such a vulnerable, vulnerable and beautiful place. Because all these other people, Lord, in this life have hurt us and we're guarded and we don't want to be rejected. But Lord, you come to us and you find us in, in that place and you hold us and you tell us that we're loved and you tell us that we're worthy, God, in this season where you send your son for that very reason to love us where we are, not who you want us to be 20 years from now, God, but you find us where we are in this moment of vulnerability. And for some of us that might be in a, in a place of hurt right now. And for some of us that might be in a place of just pure joy, God, and just sitting with you and Lord, wherever that spectrum is, I know that you're there and that you're gonna show up just like Jesus showed up for us. You sent him to show up for us. God, so I pray that this season, we remember that and that the enemy, that the enemy has no stronghold, Lord, on us this season because you are our gift, God. You sent us the ultimate gift, knowing my guard would be up and knowing that I'm gonna fail, God. You sent your son to love me as I am. And I pray that every person here this morning or watching God knows in their deepest of deepest places in their soul, God, that you love them as they are. So we linger here with you this morning, God. As we walk out of these doors, God, as we turn off our computer, wherever we're watching this, Lord, we know that we can linger here with you. Thank you for this season and thank you for this, these people, for your people. God, I say all of these things in your son Jesus' name, amen. Y'all can have a seat. Good morning, Brown Community Church. How's everybody doing today? You look great. You're welcome. <laughs> Just kidding. Got to get you laughing a little bit, okay? It's okay. Uh, man, we're so glad that you came to worship with us this morning. If you are new here, we just have one favor and one favor only. If you could just scan that QR code in the seat in front of you with your camera app on your phone um, and click the connect card, okay? That's the most important part today because we want to make sure that you're connected with us so we, we can let you in on our like cool little secret hangouts and stuff. They're not secrets, okay? Everybody's invited, all right? Uh, but we want to be sure that you're invited as well. So please, if you could just get that done for us today. It's really easy and simple, and you just got to click that connect card. Sound good? All right, if you're online with us at Brownway Community, uh, you can always go to our website, brownwaycommunity.com, and click the connect card. It'll take you straight there, too. All right, um, if you came prepared to give this morning, man, we are so thankful for those of you that continually give. I don't I don't know um, who did it, but um, somebody gave us a, a major donation for a next-gen building, and it was awesome because we went to Walmart and we spent so much money and we had the best time yesterday, and so we are just so thankful for those of you that, that believe in our next generation and, and believe in what we're doing at Brownwood Community Church, and if you'd like to continue to give, or maybe this is your first time to give, we do have a couple of options in the room for you. Again, you can scan that that awesome QR code, or there's a black box on the uh, wall as you leave, or you can always give at brownwoodcommunity.com. And again, um, from the youth's heart and from me, they're not going to tell you thank you, but I'll tell you thank you. You know teenagers, right? They're not going to say thanks. Um, but we, as our youth leaders, will say thank you. We're so honored that um, you love us so well, so thank you so much. Um, I don't have a whole lot of announcements today, so you're probably like, thank God, because she talks too much sometimes, right? Um, the only announcement that I have today is December 14th. It's a Wednesday, all right, and we are going to have our family fun night. If you've never been to a family fun night, let me tell you, it is the funnest fun night 
ever, all right? Um, and we're gonna wear our tacky Christmas sweaters and you're gonna wanna come because we're gonna get Scotty into one and I don't care what he says, we're gonna ignore his negativity and we are going to get him in a Christmas sweater and it's gonna be awesome. Um, there's gonna be games, there's gonna be time to hang out. If you would like to participate and bring something, that potluck is gonna be on our Facebook page today as well as the QR code that you can scan with your phone, all right? Sound good? You're all gonna come, right? Okay, if you didn't say yes, I'm gonna come find you and I'm gonna make you come, just kidding. All right, um, and so that's all the announcements that I have today, all right? Uh, just go ahead and let yourself know that we are not gonna have a Christmas service on December 25th. It's a Sunday, all right? Spend that time with your family, but other than that, we're gonna watch this video and we're gonna get started. y'all y'all raring to go this morning you sounded like you were you guys are fired up and this morning and you're creating some heat in here we don't have the heater on if it gets hot in here it's your fault you bring all that warmth in with you right yeah see and katie she, she tries to warm y'all up for me but you got to work on your comedy so that they're warmer when no, i'm kidding <laughs> i got to get back at her because she's like threatening me about this christmas sweater and stuff like yeah i don't even hardly wear sweaters Anybody with, you guys with me, they itch, don't they? Like, you don't like sweaters, do you? Y'all help me out here, guys. All right, thanks, Andy. I appreciate it. The only one brave enough to say you don't like sweaters in front of your wife. But uh, anyway, I'll stop while I'm ahead. Um, Messiah, I'm not a, sh thanks, Bill. Uh, my greatest cheerleader right there. You're fired, you know. Uh, wow, Messiah. So we got started last week, and we preached through the genealogy. It was awesome, wasn't it? Yeah. So there's so much there. But so uh, talking about this word Messiah, here's the thing. It's, it's a Jewish term. It's not a term we would use typically in any other setting other than church setting. We talk about Jesus because now we know Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, so but when Jesus showed up on the scene in the first century, Lots of Jewish people had this sense of expectation that there was going to be some kind of Messiah person show up. There was enough in their Jewish scriptures that prophesied about this and foretold something about this. And they had all these different kinds of expectations of what this person would look like. So they probably had in their mind, many of them, that God would send a savior, a Messiah, a deliverer of some sort that would be kind of in the mold of maybe Moses. If you think of the story of Moses, Moses would be a Messiah that God used to deliver his people out of slavery and out of bondage in Egypt and all that. Okay, so that was a big part of their identity. So when they thought about God was going to do that again, they're thinking in that mold, okay? And so many of them had all these kinds of expectations. They, they knew that a, a Messiah from God was going to show up from some point. And what they knew for sure was that this Messiah would be a kingly royal figure that would come from the lineage of King David. And when you say King David to them, he's larger than life. King David was the dude, even though he screwed up like most of the kings did, but he was this royal figure that God had worked his promises through and fulfilled his purposes through. And now this new Messiah that was going to show up in this age was going to be from King David. And so the thing is, is that descending from King David brought massive expectations because he's such a big figure, such a big part of their identity as a nation and the promise that God gave him, this king that would be on his throne forever and all these things. And so with these huge, huge expectations, and that's why Matthew, like we talked about last week, was pointing out 
taking time in the genealogy to make sure that we understood that this was the royal line. And it's uh, interesting if you think about the expectations that those people had in that day when Jesus showed up and people begin to go, is he, is he, is he? I don't know. If you think about it in our day, think of it in our political realm as a nation. Think, don't, don't get religious on me this morning, okay? Think you as an American, okay? So let me, let me ask you, what kind of president could fix all our country's problems? And as many people are in the room, there's as many different explanations and opinions on what that would look like, right? I mean, so many different answers that we could come up with about what we would expect if we had this prophecy, if you would, or understanding that someone was going to show up as a new president, a new leader that would lead us to freedom once and for all. We would all have a different picture and an expectation of what he would look like. So what kind of president could fix all our country's problems? Maybe say something like this. We could use another George Washington. Get us back to the glory days, right? Be quiet, historian. <laughs> She's got varying opinions on the people we think so highly of in history, right? We could use another George Washington, you know, oh, it's like, oh, that would be the best if we could get him back. Or maybe in a different vein, I'm just trying to think of the big names. Or, or we could use another Abraham Lincoln. Because uh, like in the Civil War days, our country was a mess. Our country is kind of a mess. We fight all the time. We're so divided and all those things. Maybe, maybe an Abraham Lincoln could navigate that as a leader, right? So think of this. What if, what if there were an heir of like if it could be proven that like, this is a direct descendant of George Washington and he's running for president, would you, I mean, what would you think? Would you be going, it's worth a shot, right? Uh, you know, I mean, he's got the right DNA, the right bloodline, all these things. Maybe he could get us back to those days when we were not so divided. But this term Messiah carried all of this kind of expectation and weight about who he would be and what he would do, mostly this sense of the royal figure who would reestablish the nation of Israel as an independent, powerful nation, again, like in their glory days when David was king. So N.T. Wright describes this uh, expectation around Messiah. He says this way. He says, in practice, Messiah is mostly restricted to the notion which took various forms in ancient Judaism of the coming king who would be David's true heir through whom Yahweh would rescue Israel from pagan enemies. A true king, and he makes a point to point that out because the Jewish pseudo king that was in place at that point, Herod, was no heir of David. He was not from that bloodline, and that was an issue for a lot of people, and not to mention he was a bit of a tyrant and a coward, right? We see that in the story of Jesus' birth, if you combine all the Gospels to get a, bit, a bigger picture. So the question would be, then what kind of Messiah would rescue God's people? Because that's the question they were all trying to answer, some of their expectations had some merit to it, right? Because, I mean, if you think about what he was going to do, the Messiah's mission would indeed be a rescue mission. It would be a rescue mission. And, and Matthew, whose gospel we're looking at in this series, Matthew, the writer of that gospel, would tell us a little bit more in the, what we're going to look at today about what kind of Messiah this Jesus is ended up being. And the interesting thing is that some of it that we th take for granted about who Jesus is and was, some of it was completely unexpected on their part. And Matthew begins to bring part of that out as he talks about it. And look at what he says here just to start out. Okay. He says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. Okay, and again, we're all familiar with Christmas and the Christmas story, so we kind of know the story. But put yourself 
in the first century, the late first century, when the church was brand new and these gospels had been written down or maybe just verbalized for the most part orally and passed around. But imagine you're in this small ecclesia congregation gathering of Christians, which weren't really called Christians till later, but called followers of Jesus, followers of the way. Imagine you're gathered in this small gathering, probably a little bit secret for safety purposes, and somebody shows up with the gospel of Matthew. And all you've heard basically to this point is about Jesus, his death and resurrection, because that was the main thing, right? I mean, that is where the gospel comes from is through his death and resurrection. And so they might've heard bits and pieces of some of the things he's taught and he said and all this stuff. I mean, it was all being put together and recorded and written down the way we have it. And imagine you're maybe sitting around a fire or, or huddling together in, in a basement somewhere and, and they're trembling as they read this and they read the words of Matthew. They've never heard this story before. And he says, this is how. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. Imagine the expectation that they would have, the excitement that they would have as those words are read. Matthew saying, okay, now we know about his death and resurrection, but let me tell you the beginning of the story. And they would be in such anticipation as they continued to read. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And if you heard that, you'd be thinking, really? And so what Matthew's pointing out here, now remember, Matthew's telling a very Jewish version because his audience is primarily Jewish followers of Jesus or Jewish people he wanted to follow Jesus. And, 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 and it is very specific in how he does things here. So this pledge to be married, it's like a betrothal period. And so someone would be uh, given to a man, a woman would be given to a, one, a, a man to be his wife, but it would take about a year. He, it would be this contract between the father of her, her father, and, and, and the man that was going to marry her. And so about a year or so, I don't think there's a hard, fast rule, the man would go home and prepare for his bride to come home with him, come together. It's not just about sex. Get your head out of the gutter, right? (laughs) Okay, yeah. It included that, but it wasn't just about that. So before they came together, before, that end, before the end of that period of time, when they would have the ceremony and the, you know, coming together of bride and groom into a household and all of that and consummating the marriage physically, he's saying before that all happened, while they were just in this preliminary period, Mary, he says, was found to be pregnant. And Matthew throws in there through the Holy Spirit. Now, did Joseph know that? So Matthew's gospel, when he's telling the birth story, I think Matthew's in a way telling the story through the eyes of Joseph. Because Luke tells a lot through the eyes of Mary. When you read the story, you get a lot of Mary's perspective. You don't even get some of that stuff in Matthew's. He's talking because he talked about the lineage in the genealogy last week. And it was the lineage, the genealogy through Joseph, not Mary. But if you go read the one in Luke, it's through Mary. Okay, it's interesting. This is Matthew's perspective as he's pointing all of this out. So this betrothal, this contract between Joseph and Mary's father, whom we don't even know anything about, it's a contract and this situation comes up and is like, oh, what do we do? Because this, this is all out of order, right? It's not supposed to happen this way but that's how it happened. And if you're the woman, especially, you don't want to back out on this at this point. You're hoping it goes through. And Matthew goes on to describe Joseph a little bit. He says, because Joseph, her husband, already referring to her as her, as her husband, right? Her husband, Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, 
to the Torah. He was a good, devout Jewish man and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. What a guy, right? He had in mind to divorce her quietly. So instead of letting this be a spectacle where Mary would be shamed and blamed and who knows what, I don't know if they were actually able to stone young women at that point because of Rome, but it certainly would not be a good ending for Mary if Joseph took the normal route, right? So Joseph, being a faithful man, a good man, he's thinking, okay, well, I guess, I mean, there's no way to go forward with this, he's thinking, so I'll just take care of this quietly and try to save her some dignity, okay? That's Joseph. But after he considered this, Matthew tells us, it's like, oh, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And look what he says. The angel says, Joseph, read it with me, son of David. Son of David. And in the other version of the birth story, when they go to Bethlehem and all that is taken into detail and such, they went to Bethlehem because Joseph was the son of David. Because Bethlehem was the city of David. They were going there because that's where he had to go for the census that was taking place, okay? So in pointing this out, just again, staying focused on Matthew's telling this story, and he's very much making a point to, sh to show that Jesus is the Messiah who came through David. I know what you're thinking, right? You're thinking literal terms, you're thinking, but he's not really the son of Joseph. Jesus is not really the son of Joseph. You're, you're thinking that, right? It doesn't matter to them. It doesn't, no, it's like, that's not the point. They're talking about the legal aspects of this, that Jesus came, was a son of Joseph, even though the mechanics are a little different. Okay, okay, sorry. And the, the angel continues on. Okay, remember what Joseph had in his mind to do. The angel continues, says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Don't be afraid to go through with the way it's supposed to go, right? Don't be afraid. Why? Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now, I imagine when I read the Bible, I try to imagine and fill in some of the gaps. Matthew doesn't fill any gaps when you, when you read his gospel. He's giving you the bottom line, men like Matthew and his gospel. Just bottom line, just don't, get, don't get all cut up in all the story. Just, just tell me what happened, right? And that's kind of what Matthew does. And Luke fills in some of the gaps for us. But Joseph gets this incredible confirmation that this child that Mary is pregnant with is from the Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural thing. It takes a, a supernatural dream and an angel speaking to him to say, no, don't be afraid. This is from the Holy Spirit. It's true. Now, I don't know if they told, like, I don't know if the excuse given to Joseph when Joseph becomes aware of Mary being pregnant without his involvement, if they said, no, this, this is from the Holy Spirit. If Mary said that or her father tried to explain that to him to convince him to move forward, Joseph's probably thinking, yeah, I ain't buying that, right? I mean, we wouldn't either until we had this supernatural dream where an angel comes and goes, no, don't be afraid to take her. This is really from the Holy Spirit. And now listen to the instructions that Matthew, or that Matthew tells us the angel gave to Joseph. The angel says this to him. She will give birth to a son. He's like, woohoo, because that was a big deal to have a son first, especially. And you are to give him the name Jesus. This is where he gets his name. Because what? Because he will save his people from their sins. There's that rescue mission we're talking about. But that's what the name Jesus means. Same, the Jewish version is Joshua, Savior, God save us, or the per, God would save his people. That's what it represented. So this is where Jesus gets his name through the angel, through Joseph. Joseph gets the privilege to name his son. That was a big deal back then and for them because he will save his people from 
his, their sins. And so, to the people of Israel at that time, they were physically, in a sense, no longer in exile in Babylon. Okay, if you go back and read the, the Old Testament, we don't have time to go there this morning. Most of them ended up in exile in Babylon, and it was a result of their sin and rebellion and all of that. Okay, we kind of know a little bit about that. Okay, at the time this all is happening, they're no longer in Babylon, but they still feel like they're in spiritual exile from God. Because nothing's the way it was in the glory days. The temple's not the same. There's no real true sense of the presence of God among them. And here it is, this baby's going to be born. He's going to be named Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. In their mind, what that would mean is that God would finally, finally deal with and forgive them of their sins. And the way that would play out in their mind is this Messiah would show up and take care of the Romans and all the things in their world that made them feel like they were still in exile. And when they were finally taken care of and put in their proper place, which is not in Israel, and Israel's reestablished as a kingdom through this Messiah, then that would be the sign that God had finally forgiven them for all their sins. So again, all this incredible expectation of what this Messiah figure was supposed to do. He was going to reestablish the Jewish monarchy, the Jewish kingdom. And then Matthew, I referred to his tendency to do this last week, says all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. Okay, now we're going we're gonna to look at it. He's, he's going to quote the prophet Isaiah. And it, it's really interesting that this is the one he quotes because it's this other name that we know Jesus by, but it's not talked about hardly any time except at Christmas time. We sing the songs about it and all that stuff, but it comes out in Matthew's gospel, and I believe it's Matthew's gospel only that ever uses this name referring to Jesus, pointing back to fulfillment of this prophecy from the prophet Isaiah. Here it is. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. You're like, okay, yeah, we know that. It's Mary, right? And look what he says. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God was with Israelites, the Israelites in the Old Testament, starting with Moses, right? So they come out of Egypt, all these incredible signs and wonders that God did to bring them out of Egypt through the Red Sea. We know the stories. And, and as, as the, the people of Israel were these wanderers around the desert, the wilderness, God led them by his very presence. And the, the sign of God's presence with them was the cloud by day and the fire by night. So God with us had this, this, this image in their mind of what, it, of what it looked like for God to be with his people. But they had no idea that one day when the Messiah named the Savior showed up that he would literally be God with them as one of them, completely unexpected. This would blow their mind and they're going, well, what? Nobody expected the Messiah to be God in the flesh. They expected a Messiah like Moses, who was a great man, a huge figure of a man who God used to deliver them, but Moses was not God. They would never worship Moses. Though they got pretty close sometimes, maybe, right? God would send himself. And, and to our knowledge, there's, there's no reference to that, that vague, unusual prophecy from Isaiah. No, nobody until Matthew, at least on record that we have, would, would use that prophecy about the Messiah 
I mean, to them that, that, that there would be a baby born and some supernatural occurrence that would represent that God is with us. It wouldn't literally be that the baby was God with us, but Matthew says, that's what happened. Emmanuel, God with us as one of us. Wow. So when Joseph woke up, <laughs> he's a good man. He did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. And this tells you he's a truly strong, devout man, and it also spells some rumors about Mary after Jesus. <laughs> Matthew makes a point to tell us, but he, as in Joseph, did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Jesus. Here's this upside down, backwards, out of order story of the birth of this child with all these supernatural occurrences around it, including how the baby was conceived by the Holy Spirit and not from a man. So upside down, so crazy, that only God could pull something like this off. But the point and the emphasis here that Matthew is drawing out of the story is how important the names of this Messiah are. And in this part of the story, He's the Messiah who is Jesus, our Savior, and Emmanuel, God, with us. Wow. Wow. So Emmanuel, God, with us, who is the Savior, who is the Messiah, when you put all that together, the amazing part of this is that God saved his people. But how did God save his people? God saved us not from a distance, but by becoming one of us. Isn't that just incredible to think about? What kind of God, what kind of God would do that? I mean, the pagans of that day, their idea of gods and how gods interacted with people, they were just kind of toyed with them. They didn't, they didn't get intimate with them. They don't come close to them, not to be with them and be one of them. No, they always set themselves apart as better and above. And, and yet God, our true God, the one true God, decides the way he's going to save us and reconcile us and bring us back to him is show up in flesh as one of us to perfectly and finally identify with us, it's unbelievable. Matthew comes back to this at the end of the story with Jesus. We know it as the Great Commission, but we tend to forget what he says at the very end of it. This is literally the last line in Matthew's gospel. Look at what he says through, that Jesus says before he leaves. Surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's how Matthew ends his gospel, his witness to who Jesus is, was, and what he did. God with us, the Messiah, would be God in the flesh, one of us, to save us. Do you believe that God is with you? I mean, like, more than just for you and on your side. I mean, that's good in and of itself, isn't it? But <laughs> do you believe God is with you? When you sit in silence or when you sit in sadness or when you're in your darkest moments, most depressed moments, maybe even your most joyful, good moments. Do you believe that God is with you? That he really was that concerned about us, that he would come and be with us in the flesh, go through all that he went through to be with you? Do you believe it's for you? Do you believe God is with you. Maybe you think something like, I, I want to believe he's with me, Scotty, but 
but if, if, if God were with us, wouldn't he fix us? It's a, it's a great, great question. Great. You didn't, guys didn't know you were theologians, but that's a theological question. I mean, if, if God were with us, wouldn't he fix some of this stuff? We're a mess. You're a mess. <laughs> Your neighbor's a mess. Your spouse is a mess. Just don't tell her. <laughs> so it's certainly a valid question to ask. And, and it might be similar to what people were expecting the Messiah to do when he showed up. They're thinking, finally, we're going to have someone to put all our hope in who will fix all this stuff with the Romans and with each other and the, the corruption of the temple and the men that are charged there and how awful things are, the poor and the destitute. And we're not the glorious nation we thought we were supposed to be. Surely God will show up through this Messiah and fix us. It's why he got rejected by so many. They're thinking, no, he's, that can't be the Messiah. He shows up on Palm Sunday, and it's like the crowd goes nuts because they're finally thinking, he's here. We're about to do this thing. It's about to go down. Rome's about to go down, right? And we don't have that expectation, but, but we think, wouldn't God have fixed us? I mean, why did he go through all of this and not fix us? <laughs> when Jesus, our Messiah, made his appearance, the world didn't suddenly become a better place. Circumstantially, physically, I'm talking about. You know why? He didn't come as a fixer. came as a savior. And that might sound like bad news. That's what you want and that's what you expect. But there's so much good to this. Think about this. The darkness of our world does not keep God at a distance. And we think that way. We think that it means God's not with us anymore. Somehow God's not present. Even in those people in that day, they thought that God was completely absent. God had turned his back on them, walked away from them because of their unfaithfulness. But we know better. God is faithful even when we're not. Our religious separatist mindset thinks that because we're so screwed up and so messed up and so broken that God puts himself at a distance because he just can't stand to be near us. And Jesus, Emmanuel, <laughs> tells us that's not who God is. No, it's not who he is. God is not appalled by us. He is not disgusted by us. He doesn't turn away thinking, ugh, I can't deal with this. In and as Jesus, Emmanuel, he waded into the darkness and the mess that we had made of ourselves and of his beautiful world. And he says, I'm going to show up and be with you in this. God wants to be with us more than he wants to fix us. He wants to be with us. And we have some experience with this with each other. That this is true about you personally, too. He wants to be with you more than he wants to fix you. And I know you've been told some other things and preached to in some other ways, but I'm telling you the truth of the gospel, according to Matthew, is that the point is that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And he didn't suddenly show up and everything was great. In fact, he lived through betrayal and rejection and scoffing and shaming and nakedness and brutal death at the hands of the enemy. Wow. And it didn't suddenly fix everything, but it assured us that God wasn't afraid to be with us.
in our mess. He wants to be with us more than he wants to fix us. Because if he just tried to fix you, anybody ever had a relationship? Don't raise your hand. Relationship? (laughs) Where he or she tried to fix you? How did you like that? Wasn't very loving, was it? Trying to squeeze you into a mold. Like, now I know God would have the perfect mold. I get that, I get that. But that's not the point. God's very relational and intimate with us. And he doesn't show up to fix us. He shows up to be with us so that we know we're never, ever, ever, ever alone. God is the greatest companion possible. then if God is with me, what difference does it make for me? Another great question. Another great question. What, what, what if you started trusting the words of Jesus that is with you? Like you really trust that Jesus, by his spirit now, is really with, with me. I mean, what difference would it make? Would it make a difference? I can't tell you the answer to that. I know I can tell you for me it's made all the difference most of the time. Yeah? But you have to remind yourself you're not alone. That the God of the universe, the one who created everything you can see and know and experience, including you, yourself, he is with you. Say it with me. One, two, three. God is with me. Say it again. God is with me. One more time. God is with me. Paul said, nothing can separate us from the love of God, from God who is love. Nothing can separate us from him. Even in the midst of darkness, in the darkest of times in our world, and in our personal lives, we can know because of the story of Christmas and what it explains about Jesus, our Savior, that no matter how dark, no matter how harsh or how bad or broken, that even in and through death, God is Emmanuel. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us and his promise to his disciples then is the same promise he makes to us that I will be with you always to the very end of this present age that's incredible news let me pray for us heavenly father thank you that you (laughs) made this incredible plan and purpose, and you fulfilled it through Jesus, our Savior. And Lord, that through him we can know you are with us. Even when we can't feel you or see you or experience the fruit of it, that we can know for certain you are with us. Remind us of that during this Christmas season that this is what we celebrate, that you became one of us, lived among us, and did everything necessary to save us. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for being here. If there's anything we can do for you, don't hesitate to contact us and let us know. We know this can be a hard season for many, many reasons. If there's anything you need, Give us a call, shoot us an email. We'd love to meet with you and encourage you. God bless you. Y'all have a wonderful week.